Welcome back to GA Fan TV. My name is Aaron. I'm delighted to be joined here by Matthew Hurley of the GA Statsman podcast. We're going to be running through all the weekends, big talking points in both football and hurling. I suppose starting off with football because there was some huge, huge games obviously at the weekend. Our man knocking out Tyrone, thrown out of the championship. The All Ireland champions packing their bags early in June. He also had big wins for Mayo, Cork, and also Clare as well. Mead crashing out of the championship in the opening round of the qualifiers as well. We run through the Tolchin Cup and, of course, um, some of the, the weekend's big hurling games as well, including that huge, huge win for uh, for Limerick against Clare. Just a reminder, we're brought to you by Declan Kirby GA Star, the best children's GA book out there in the market. At the minute, you can find it on Amazon, Eason's, all good bookshops, so make sure to check it out in the description down below when you get the chance. Matthew, I suppose, look, it was an action-packed weekend of, uh, of Gaelic games from the football to the hurling so much going on. I mean, how how on earth do we try and process all that happened at the weekend with Tyrone getting knocked out, Mayo getting through in controversial circumstances, the Cody Shefflin shake and just everything that was really going on? Absolutely, Aaron. And uh, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, especially like the Sunday games were unbelievable to say the least. Like the Armagh Tyrone game, what drama and that. Like there was a Look, even the Armagh player wish uh, Connor back at a speedy recovery as well after that mm. uh, horrid injury he got. And a load of things happening. The, um, the throne and Armagh fans applauding um, after after stuff happening during the week related to Michaela Hart. Like, that was that was brilliant for both fans, to be honest. There was a lot of stuff happening. The Cody Shefflin handshake. Even Antrim and Kerry in the hurling in Joe McDonough was absolutely unbelievable. So... Yeah, low playing defensive football. Like, there was absolutely a load of action going on this weekend. And um, yeah, we're going to delve into it now in um, this live stream. But geez, there was a lot to look at and uh, a lot of studying to do over the weekend. A lot of games to look at. Yeah, Match Attacks Kid was saying, is there a draw for the next game? So there is, yeah. So Cork are playing Limerick, Roscommon playing Clare, Mayo against Kildare and uh, you've also got Armand Donegal playing against each other again so we'll certainly maybe touch on them a little bit later but speaking of Armagh who we were just speaking of there it was Armagh 116 Tyrone 110 famous famous win for the Yorkshire County probably the biggest win since Kieran McGinney has taken charge of the Armagh footballers to be honest I know he got a big win against Dublin and Tyrone in the league earlier in the year but this is really when it matters because you feel like maybe his job was on the line here if if they had a lost this game but they come through it by six points they keep their nerve and beat their big rivals in the process i mean it doesn't get much it doesn't get much better than that really if you're not if you are an arm fan absolutely not like he, what an unbelievable achievement uh, for arm to beat their near rivals in the knock thrown out of the championship and uh, I, I was delighted to see him out of the championship after what Sean Cavan said about Cork earlier on and Cork has stayed in the championship longer than Tyrone like um, that's laughable in his, in his own right but um, yeah fair play to Armand they were absolutely brilliant yesterday they had a rocky start in fairness to them like Conor McKenna with a brilliant goal Aiton Nugent got a brilliant goal himself to put Armand in the driving seat and Eaton Rafferty, that goalkeeper, he was unbelievable. Like at the start of the year, we were thinking Blaine Hughes would be the main goalkeeper, but in fairness to him, he pulled off saves, he got two points himself from play. Let, uh, let me add that, like not even 45s or free. What a performance from him. Reno O'Neill was excellent, Rory Grugan. You look at their midfielders, Connor Mackin made an unbelievable um impact on the game as well. Like that saving tackle. I know Tyrone were a bit behind. I think they were six points behind at that point. But that was crucial at that point to catch the ball in midair and to come out with it. And again, like it could have been a three point game, but Tyrone could have got back into it. So fair play to Connor Mackin there and well done to Armagh. What a brilliant cheap of that there was maybe a dagger hanging over Kieran McGinney's head before the game. Like if they would have lost this, maybe there was arguments that he could have been sacked despite you know, doing well in the league. There was questions, where does our Armagh team are going? They, we know if the, they have the quality of players, but could they just put it off on the biggest of days? And they did, in fairness to them. With Tyrone, though, Aaron, I don't know where they go from here. Like, here McGeary, Geary was dropped to the bench, Colin McShane. There seems to be unrest in the camp. There seems to be players dropping out. They have to draft in the likes of Rory Canavan and Mikey McLean and now into the panel, mm. del delving into the under-20. So... Yeah, it doesn't look good for Tyrone, but maybe it's the fact they just can't deal with the pressure of retaining an all-earned title. They haven't done so in the past, and this team certainly didn't do so. So, fair play to Armagh, but Tyrone, 
will struggle to see where they go next year. Yeah, and uh, B. Sheehy here, 94, says, worst All-Ireland defence since Tyrone lost to Leash in 2006. And yeah, I mean, you'd have to say, like, it, it probably is, you know, the, the worst defence of an All-Ireland that I can think of now. I'm sure if you went back through the history books, I'm sure you might find, uh, you know, a team, a big team maybe who who lost in the provincial championship when there was no qualifiers or whatever. But certainly in the modern era, this does feel like one of the worst defences ever of an All-Ireland, really, because like when you break it down, they came through for Mana fairly comfortably, but they did have one or two scares in that game. Beaten by Derry out the gate, wasn't really competitive, was very com- very comfortably beaten. And now in this game as well, like even in the final 10 to 15 minutes, they didn't really go for it. There was no push, there was no kick from this Tyrone side. And even the players who came off the bench, there just wasn't... Just didn't really seem to be that hunger there that you know to, to, to go on and try turn it around. It nearly felt like Tyrone were playing in a in a, an opening day of the league or, or something like that, you know. I did, yeah. Like even the players coming on, you would have expected the likes of Mikey McLean, and especially Kieran McGeary, player of the year last year, coming onto the pitch. Conor McShane. I was watching the game from um, my coach um, on Sunday, so I was just thinking. Colin McShane, if he's going to stick a claim for this team, he has to get a goal. And he probably would have got a goal if his confidence was up. But it probably shows this year. And it just ran home the point. Colin McShane was way off it this year. Maybe he was just dropped for a reason. Like He did very well in the All-Ireland series last year. Scored a goal against Mayo in the final. He scored a brilliant goal as well in the semi-final against Kerry. But he just wasn't on it this year. He only scored, I think, one point from play throughout the year, like at the championship, I think he scored one point. Like even look at their stats this year, only Darren McCurry could say he played well enough this year. When you look at the rest of the team, they were they were awful. They were gone awful, even looking at their midfield. Brian Kennedy wasn't there yesterday because he got stupidly sent off against Derry. Con Kilpatrick did not have the same influence either. Like maybe they were just the one uh, once in a blue moon team or something like that. I, I don't know what it was. Like to have one player out of the All Ireland champions to perform, I mean, you know, and you would say it's the worst ever in the modern era. I probably have to agree with that. I said someone in the comments just said that it was the worst since 2006 against Leash. It probably was. Like a lot of people pointing p- towards Cork's defence in 2011, but at least, look, I think that was one half against Mayo in uh, the quarterfinals back then. But with Tyrone, it was just throughout the championship. Like Fermanagh could have even won that game in the first game. Like Josh Argo Willis was cutting through them in that first game. And when you look at the Derry game, like it wasn't a contest. Let, let's be real. And, you know, we thought it'd be a tighter game. We actually thought Tyrone would be favourites going into the game. But Derry just outplayed them from start to finish. And it seemed like that since the Conor McKenna goal, you would have expected a bit of kick in that Tyrone team. And there just wasn't, other than the likes of Darren McCurry. So that was disappointing for Fergal Logan and Brian Dewar. We'll have to see what they do next year. But, for this year, I'm afraid it is a failure of a year, Aaron. Yeah. Hello, my name is James. Says uh, us Tehran people think Sean Kavanagh is a clown as well. Not good enough yesterday, simple as. And yeah, look, great player. Obviously, one of the one of the best footballers to ever play for Toronto, no doubt about it. But perhaps as a pundit, maybe not his uh, not his best role uh, in general. Dylan says here that was one of the worst performances from from an All Ireland holder since Kerry lost to Down in uh, in 2010. It's a fair point as well. Like, I mean, yeah, just very strange. Just never never got out of, like, third gear at all. They were never really in the game. Like, I mean, Armagh seemed very, very comfortable. Even when Tyrone had a little bit of a kick in the final 15 minutes, they just couldn't really sustain it. Um, but look, from an Armagh perspective, you have to give them the credit because, I mean, obviously they, they finished the league a little bit poorly in, in their own right. Obviously being beaten by Donegal, a lot of hype around them at the start of the year. You were thinking, has, has it fizzled out a little bit? Has the hype fizzled out? Maybe they aren't quite as good as, as what we thought they were. But look, you have to give them the credit because, you know, the likes of Stefan Campbell, Rory Grugan, Aidan Nugent, I thought, had a, had a very good game. A lot of options coming off the bench there as well, like Connor Turba, Andrew Mernon looked very good. So, I mean, for Armagh, like, they're going to be a tough, tough team to beat. And going up against Dunny Hall, I mean, I know Donegal have got a brilliant record against our man in recent seasons, but I mean, that's going to be a, a fiercely competitive game. Really could go down to the war. It absolutely could. And our man would have confidence. Like, like they lost to Donegal in the Ulster Championship, but most in most years, 
the loser of that game would go on to beat the team they lost to later on the championship if they beat again. So Armagh would be confident going into that game. And look at the players for Armagh yesterday. Stephen Campbell was eventually named man of the match, an outstanding performance from him. But honestly, you could have picked any of the 15 from Armagh. The goalkeeper, Ethan Rafferty, to the corner forward, Jason Duffy, who had an excellent game for Armagh. They had 10 different scores on Sunday. They were absolutely superb. They were kicking left, right and centre. And the quality of scores they took as well, like Andrew Morning coming off the bench was absolutely superb. Like at that point towards the end, there was a lot of pressure on him with that kick. And it was it was like he was starting all year, to be honest with you. He was absolutely superb coming off the bench. Connor Mackin, who I mentioned, didn't score the game, but that vital interception. Reno Neal probably hasn't scored as much as he wanted in this championship campaign so far, but he was absolutely superb. Even he was in defense towards the end of the game. Mm clearing up ball as well. Like They were absolutely superb all over the field, working for each other as well. And that's the win they needed to get, get them off the mark. Like Kieran Donaghy interview, getting interviewed afterwards as well and saying there's a good vibe in the camp. That has to be good for our man moving forward. They they probably put a lot into yesterday's game, which would probably be a worry for them going into the Donegal game next week. But I'd actually be confident that our man could win again. Like Confidence is a big thing. And Donegal are off the back of a disappointing performance against Derry. So... Really, I think Armagh, it's a realistic game. They could get to Crow Park in quarterfinal season, maybe even a semi-final if they get a lucky draw. So, you know, Armagh, our team to be watched and to even look at their performances in the league as well, to judge it even more. Like against Dublin, they were superb. Against Tyrone as well. Like, Tyrone twice, actually, in the league, they were superb as well. People seem to forget that performance. So... Armagh, the sky's the limit for them. They have some very good scores. They have some very good workers all over the field. And I think they can beat Donegal next week because of the confidence they'll get after yesterday's game. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, and, and obviously coming in on on the back of a win, Donegal obviously coming in on the back of a back of a, a defeat. And Mick says here, uh, great buzz around the county, third time. Lucky roll on Clonus. And that's going to be it. I mean, it's going to be a first game, no doubt about it, and certainly one we're uh, we're all very excited for. I suppose to finish up on on Tyrone, then I mean, Fergal Ogue and Brian Duher obviously delivered a, an All Ireland in their first season, so I don't think they're going to be going anywhere. You know, I think you, you would have to get behind them really because of the fact that they delivered Tyrone's first All Ireland in what twelve years? You know, since two thousand eight. So you know, I think they they definitely should get behind them. But I mean, for Tyrone next year. I mean, w- with the unrest of players opting out and, you know, eight lads leaving the panel this year, I mean, like, could they be back up there again next year or, or, or what do you reckon? I mean, it seems like a long way off. They definitely have the quality, definitely have the talent. They have the underage structures in place. But, I mean, it's a hard one to know with them, really, because when you look at performances like this, you know, it, it's. I mean, there's a long way to go, obviously, between now and next year, but you're kind of looking at it and thinking, like, how, how on earth did they go from All-Ireland champions to this? Yeah, absolutely. Like they had a very good under twenty team. They were well drilled in that uh, competition. Like Rory Canavan was super, Michael McLean, and a lot of good players in that team. Your man Devlin, Niall Devlin from way back as well is a very good player. But the worry about Tyrone is the how easily players like the, Paul Donaghy, for example, Lee Brennan, Mark Bradley, all these very good high quality players just walked away from the panel mid season. That would be a worry for Tyrone. I thought the culture of that would have gone when Mickey Hart left, like towards the end of his reign, he wasn't picking these young players, he stuck to the players that got him over the line in Ulster Championships and whatnot, but then Fork Lugan and Brian Dewar come in, instill confidence into the team and winning all Ireland and make these players happy. But something must have gone on behind the ca- behind the scenes, to be honest with you, to see these players walk away, because on the pitch in the league, yes, they lost a few games, but they were just off the back of a holiday, and people were saying it was kind of an excuse at the early stage of the league. And then, funnily enough, against Kerry and Fitzgerald Stadium, Kevin McStay was actually saying on League Sunday that night that this was a turning point for Tyrone. And we all thought, Tyrone are back here. They're going to be all earned contenders. But it just never kicked into the gear on the championship. Like, against Fermanagh, they were flat. Against Derry, they were nothing short for disgrace in that game. And Armagh, they didn't kick on since that Conor McKenna goal. So... I don't know where this Toronto team go. They undoubtedly, as you mentioned, they have the quality. They have the under twenty talent. They have the minor talents. Looking forward to see their minors in action against Kerry on Saturday in uh, Port Leash. But at the same time, like, there is a question of temperament behind the scenes when players like Paul Donahue, who's a superb player for 
Dr. Gallant Thomas Clark just walks away from the panel just instantly. I mean, you know, Tierna McCann was another one, an experienced player, experienced campaigner. He walks away from the panel. So that would be a worry for Tyrone moving forward. So the quality is there. The temperaments for next year, I'm not entirely sure. We'll have to wait and see, I suppose. Yeah, this year is a shortened season. Tyrone players were visiting schools and parishes nonstop with Sam McGuire. They probably weren't eating whey protein shakes everywhere they went, is what uh, Culhane says there. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, obviously, I'm sure Tyrone fans are going to try to think of uh, excuses for, for, for the loss and, and try look at every reason under the sun. But I think at the end of the day, you know, throughout the league, the, the, the chat from Tyrone fans was, oh, it's only the league, like, what will we'll kick into gear? And then they kicked into gear and, you know, they obviously got big wins over Kerry and Mayo and then, you know, lost to Derry. Yeah, but sure, it's only the Ulster Championship. We, st- we still have the All-Ireland and now lost to Armagh. Ash, there's always, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> A lot, a lot of excuses, but I think, but I think at the same time, you know, you, you have you have to take the loss when uh, when it comes, and I think Armagh by far the uh, the better side. But Toronto do have clearly do have quality players, and I'm sure you know if they get their act together, they'll be there thereabouts next year. It was Mayo one thirteen, Monaghan twelve points in uh, the game on Saturday. Mayo coming through by uh, by four in the end, in quite controversial fashion. I mean. Monaghan clearly, in my opinion, and in most people's opinion, should have got a penalty right at the end mm. from the uh, fell from Lee Keegan on Connor Leonard. It was obviously an overhit pass from Aidan O'Shea as well. I'm not too sure what he's seen when he was playing that pass. But look, Mayo, probably in the balance of play, were the better side and deserved of the victory. But I mean, I suppose it, uh, with Mayo, it's always not short of drama. And that was definitely the case again here. Absolutely, and even on the penalties, like the two of them were, oh gosh, look at this highlights anyway, I didn't watch the full game because it was at the Cork game, but look at the highlights, I thought they were stonewall penalties, I know the first one, the interpretation of the foot block, it's kind of messy how to interpret it, to be honest with you, like, um, but by the letter of the law, that was a penalty, I, I don't know, it wasn't dangerous in any way, um, to be honest with you, but look, if if you block the ball with your foot at a certain distance, it's a penalty. I, I, I don't know, like, was the referee following the rule? He wasn't clearly following the rule book in that situation there. He was just taking the safety of the player. But the second one, that was a penalty. That was a stonewall penalty. Mm-hmm. I know Conor Leonard's, in fairness to him, wasn't street smart, to be honest with you. He just went down straight away. That's don't experience, to be fair to him. And he will learn as the years go by for him. But... It was clearly a pull down. I, I don't know what Parry Cassidy was seeing, to be honest with you. Even the umpires behind the goal, what they were seeing in, in that decision, I, I don't know, to be honest with you. But even watching the highlights and uh, looking at the second half of that game, was watching it on the phone. Like, like Mayo probably deserved to win the game. They had some very good scores. Matty Ryan with an outstanding point. The penalty they got was coincidentally a foot block, but that was more dangerous. That was a penalty. Kenny O'Connor stuck it away excellently there. But Mayo, being Mayo, tried to mess it up in the end, but um, they didn't. They got they got the job done eventually. But um, I just wonder how long Mayo could do this, like perform poorly and then let a team back into the game. Because Monaghan tried to employ defensive tactics from what I was hearing and look at the highlights and the Sunday game last night. But um, it didn't work for them. It clearly didn't work for them. Conor McManus getting that black card probably set them back and Mayo scoring I think 1-3 or 1-4 in that period of time really did them good and set them up for the win but um, they'd be very lucky um, after this weekend like the, those in my opinion were two storm my penalties are low what do you think about um, that yourself Aaron but um, Mayo got lucky again yeah, like, and when you're speaking about the footblock there as well, I mean, like, with the with the distance being like bigger, I mean, I think that should be even more of a reason for the penalty being given because, like, as a defender, it actually gives you more time to put, like, you you you're actually thinking about putting your leg out because there's more distance between yourself and the ball, so it actually should be more of a reason, really, for it to be a penalty. Now, I understand if the ball obviously bounces or whatever, or anything like that, and yeah, obviously, then you know it's it's not a footblock, but. Yeah, Monaghan definitely can, can find themselves a little bit unlucky. But as you said there about Mayo, I mean, it is sort of reminiscent in some ways of of what Mayo do. Like, this this is sort of what they've done when they've been in the qualifiers. I know, obviously, they got beat by Kildare, who, funny enough, they, they, they'll they obviously be playing next weekend. But when you think through a lot of those qualifier games, even when they played Cork one year, and um, when they mm-hmm. played Derry, I remember as well, like, they wouldn't play well and they'd have 
lots of awkward moments. They nearly get beat. But then by the time they got to Crow Park around the semi-finals and all Ireland finals, they'd suddenly show this leaf of, of light that you just didn't see from them throughout the entirety of the championship. And, you know, presuming eventually in all Ireland, they, they were to get to an all Ireland semi-final, let's say, you'd have Ryan O'Donoghue back on the side and a lot of the other lads back in there from injury as well. So, I mean, although it was a poor performance, like we've seen this from Mayo before, maybe not this particular Mayo team but we've seen this from Mayo as a county in the past so I mean I suppose you can't really rule them out at the same time Absolutely you can't and uh, even looking back that was 2017 the games against Derry against Clare as well in Ennis and against Cork Cork should have won it after extra time in that game I think we had more shots in that game but Dane once it got even the quarter final the first game against Roscommon they were very poor Like they were lucky that Roscommon didn't take advantage and then the replay it started to turn on then they beat Kerry in the semi-finals and they probably should have beat Dublin in the final in all honesty so look that's what Mayo kind of do I don't think they'll have to be at their full full pelt against Kildare because Kildare in my opinion are defensively naive like if they faced a side like Donegal or Roscommon they'd have to be you know match sharp but against Kildare, I think they can just about get away with it in Crow Park, especially in Crow Park. Like if it was on in Torres, I think Mayo need to be well up for the game. But it's on Crow Park, so I think Mayo can just relax a small bit and do what they do, usually do. But still, like you'd have to wonder when is it actually going to catch Mayo? Like against Kildare, that game, Kildare were much the better side at Newbridge. But when is it going to catch Mayo where Mayo were? a better team in the first half, first 10 minutes of the second half, and then they lose focus in the last few minutes. And they eventually go on and win the game like they did against Derry that year, like they did against Cork, like they did last Saturday against Monaghan. I don't know when it's going to catch them, (laughs) to be honest with you. Like, I get performing when um, things are on the line, when it's, um, you know, peak or the final season. But at the same time, you need to get over these teams. Like, if Monaghan played with a bit more vigour on Saturday. Mayo, we could be talking about Mayo being out of the championship now today. So, Mayo got away with one there. I don't know, will they get away with one in the next few? I think they will probably against Kildare. Time will tell, I suppose, moving on to Saturday. But you have to wonder, Aaron, when are they going to stop this? And when are they going to learn from them, um, you know, laxing off in the last few minutes of these crucial games? Yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely a lot. You know, game management has been the, the big problem for Mayo, really, in geez, the last 10, 15 years, to be perfectly honest, especially in big, big moments, big games. A lot of the time, they probably have got away with it. And obviously, sometimes it's it's come back to, to bite them as well. When you look at all those all Ireland finals against Dublin, Tyrone last year as well, where they've struggled to sort of manage leads in games and, and struggle to find ways to, to come from behind as well. Um, But I mean, them against Kildare, I mean, that is going to be... I mean, as you said there, in Crow Park, you know, it's probably... I think it's right that it is in Crow Park because Kildare are close to Crow Park. Mayo are obviously coming from the, the West as well. Um, some, of the, some of the games you probably put in Crow Park and, and some of them maybe you don't. But, I mean, probably it massively does suit Mayo because you feel like if this was maybe, I don't know, let's say in Breffney Park or something like that, you'd, you'd be looking at it and thinking, oh, this, you know, this, this could go either way. But in Crow Park or Mayo have that experience of coming through there on multiple occasions, their style of football as well. I do think, though, Mayo still do, although they played a lot better defensively against them um, in, in this win over Monaghan, I think against Kildare, like if Kildare can get their forwards on it, you know, obviously their question mark is their defence themselves, but like we could be looking at a great game of football, to be fair. We could, to be honest. Like, um, for the record, I don't agree with it being in Crow Park. I guess... That um, teams need to get to Grove Park, like Kildare, Mayo, when are they, well, Kildare, in fairness, played the Leinster final, but when are Mayo going to get there again? But at the same time, hotel prices are rocket- skyrocketing, diesel prices are skyrocketing, and the game is on at six o'clock on a Saturday. Like, I'd honestly feel sorry for Mayo fans just uh, traveling there in Grove Park. Yes, maybe you could get the train there, but at the same time, look, it's grand for Kildare because they could just um, drive up from home, to be honest with you. Like, Crow Park's only down the road for them, so or even get to Lewis in or something like that. But for for me, I, I don't I don't know I don't know um would you take that into consideration? Or like you look at Kerry Hurlers, they could get a hotel, they have to fly up and back. Maybe that's a situation for the Mayo footballers because let's not forget it's a week in advance of this. They may not have got a hotel for Saturday evening. 
So I, I don't know about being it being a crow park. Same for Clare Ross Common for the amount of travel those two sides have to go through and their fans. So I don't know about that. It will be an open and expansive game, definitely. Um, I, th- I think Mayo will probably win the game due to Kildare's defence. But definitely you do have a point there about Kildare's forwards, Jimmy Hyland, Derek Kieran, Daniel Flynn. If they're on form, they can cause Mayo a few problems. But I still think Mayo, you know, they have Keenan O'Connor there now. James Carr, if he gets the run in that Kildare defence, it could be trouble. And even looking at that Kildare defence against Dublin, they were defensively naive. Like three or four players going to the corner and then Conor Callan running through straight through on goal with not a finger laid on him. So if Gildare perform like they do against Dublin, it's going to be another whitewash, in my opinion. But but if they somehow improve defensively, Mayo could be in trouble, I think. Yeah, like I actually wasn't aware the game was at six o'clock, to be fair, in, uh, in Crow Park. I actually thought it was on at four o'clock. But yeah, Jesus, that's... You do make a great point, to be fair. Like, and obviously, we, we we've seen the Kerry hurlers having to get a, a chartered fly from, um, you know, back to the Kerry airport, which is just insane, really. Like, in you know, you know, when you think about it, like, um, so it's gonna be, I suppose, yeah, like as you said, like with, with Mayo fans in particular who would travel up to go go to Crow Park, like you're talking about them probably being back nearly by by midnight, to be to be honest. So I suppose when you when you do break it down, like it does it does make a lot of sense like that, but um. It definitely should be a, an interesting game. Nonetheless, uh, Match Attacks Kid says here, I think Kildare could beat Mayo. It would be 50. 50. Yeah, like after watching Kildare against Mayo, to be honest, I wouldn't be, or Kildare against Dublin, I wouldn't be too confident, to be perfectly honest, um, especially with how easily they were cut open. But, you know, with Mayo, a lot of the time, if, if you can catch them on an off day, you, you know, you just you just don't know. But obviously, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. It was Cork two twelve loud to wait in um the uh, in the Saturday the, the first of the qualifiers. Obviously, you were at this game. I watched this game, unfortunately. Um, but it was Cork two twelve loud to a bit of excitement at the end. wasn't the greatest game. Um, don't think either side were particularly brilliant. But I suppose at the same time as a Cork man, look, you got the win. You've Limerick in the next round, and all Ireland quarter final is is within touching distance now. And like if I, if you had have said that to you a couple of weeks ago, you probably would have thought it was crazy. So, yeah, absolutely. Like um, I was uh, chatting to my family about this draw. Like even thinking of um, match day five of the league against me, we were an absolute disgrace in Park Alton. And even looking at that game and before the down game, who would have said we'd be the last ace in Ireland? Of course, we have to beat Limerick next week. We're, I'm not discarding Limerick whatsoever. But if you would have said that to myself or any other Cork fan at that time. You would have said, "What? What is wrong with you? Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Do you need to go to a asylum or something like that?" Because we were absolutely awful in that league campaign, and we've got to the quarter final. Like, granted, Lowe and Limerick are probably the best. Well, they are the best draws we could have got in the run in the qualifiers. To be honest with you, but um, look at this game. I honestly, I honestly think we didn't perform too badly. To be honest, I know people will say we. We had only three scores in the game, but at the same time, like low were literally playing 15 men behind the ball. Like you look at when Samuel Roy was taking a free, all the 14 players were just walking back. They weren't um, anticipating if the ball was hitting the post or something like that. Their main objective was to frustrate Cork, just go back into the fence and keep your shape. Like I even have a photo from the game. I think Patrick Mulcahy took it from the Irish Examiner. The whole low team were inside the 65 meter line. I think other people have photos of the whole low team at the 45. Look, like, that is absolutely mental. And, you know, I, I honestly think, like, you look at Conor Grimes coming onto the pitch, if they would have started him, like, I think they would have caused Cork a few problems because you look at our full back line, I think it's vulnerable if you kick the ball into them. Like, I don't think Lowe probably realised that at the start of the game. Like, they have the forwards. Sam Roy is an excellent forward, Kieran Downey, Conor Grimes, if they started him. But their plan was clearly to frustrate us, to foul us as much as possible. Like Tommy Dorner coming onto the pitch as well. How many times was there a third man tackle? Like once he knocked over Sean Potter and somehow the free was given to load. I mean, for God's sake, you know. Mickey Hart is a clever tactician there, but to see, it was awful, awful to watch. And I suppose the changing point in the game, I know we were two points up as um, a point, but I was kind of frustrated we didn't attack them as fast as fast as possible. But then one fan from the stand behind behind us was, was saying, 
lads just keep the ball they have to come out somehow to win this game so I'm just passing yeah. around and and you know they, they eventually came out we got a goal chance we eventually missed a dramatic Taylor but that was a sign Loud had to come out they were six points down one eleven to one five. they came out we caught them on the counter attack and Brian Hurley scored a brilliant goal so that was the game there Colin McCallan then got a goal but Jeez, I, I don't want to be watching a game like that again. No no fault of Cork, I think. Look, we came up against the wall. We weren't a disgrace. I thought we played as well as we could. We were trying to do different things at different times. Yes, we were a bit sloppy at times, but I think we made the right decisions in the second half when, when it was key. But for loads, I, I don't know about yourself, Aaron, but I thought they could have done better attack-wise. They could have attacked us even more. Like, we nearly got relegated from Division 2. Like, we, we only got them um, ahead of Offaly and Down, who weren't do, too good themselves in competitions like the Tati and Cup. So, like, I think Low honestly could have attacked us earlier than they did, but they were happy to do that. Mickey Hart said he wanted to make the game interesting, but at the same time, like, I feel sorry for people like yourselves tuning into it on GA Go or me spending. I don't know, it was over 70 euro to get into Parky Key for that game and rain pelting down as well. Not a pleasant experience, but I suppose the main thing is we won. We won. That was the main thing. And we've Limburg in the next round. So happy days, I suppose. Yeah, like I mean, like like what you said there, like we like I'm all I'm all for defensive, like for different styles of football. I've said that multiple times. But I do think there has to be a point where you look at it and think, right, this isn't working for us right now. So Mickey Hart's obviously looking there and thinking, we're not getting any joy here. Like It's just being as defensive as we are here. We're not going to win the game by playing this way. So we need to try, and there needs to be a plan B. We need to try and change it up. And there didn't really seem to be that until Cork's late goal. You know, all of a sudden then they started coming alive. Like I think they kicked 1-3 from play in the final couple of minutes. And that was more than what they kicked from play in the, in the entirety of the game. So like... Clearly, they have quality footballers, as we, as we know. And once they started to play football, they actually made a bit of a game of it. And they nearly actually came mm. back and you were thinking, they might actually do something here. And as you said, like with, with Cork, I just uh, for, for me personally, I just thought they were a little sloppy at times, just with a few passes here and there. I thought there was times where they probably could have killed Loud off, and they didn't, and they probably allowed them to come back into the game. But I suppose at the same time, like you said there, like at the end of the day, you were nearly relegated from Division 2. Like, clearly, the standard isn't that high in Cork football right now. Do you know what I mean? It isn't... You aren't up there with the, the Kerrys or the Dublins or whatever. Um, But at the same time, for a lot of the young lads who are coming through, to get the experience of potentially playing in an all quarter quarterfinal mm -hmm. if you get past Limerick, I mean, it could be huge for the county because it might, that yeah. might be the buzz that the, the county needs. And, you know, although I think every team that's in the quarterfinals would probably want to play the winner of, of yeah. Cork Limerick but at the same time it's it's a free hit then because you know like it, it is a free hit and yeah. after that you, you know everything's bonus bonus for Cork really and even chatting to some fans like I had the realisation Carl Amani hasn't played in Crow Park Blake Murphy hasn't played in Crow Park Brian Hayes I don't think has played in Crow Park either Colm O'Callaghan I'm not entirely sure he's played in Crow Park either like the last time he played in Crow Park was 2019 with um, the miners doing well there, Connor Carver, Jack Callan, who came onto the panel against Lowe's, was playing that uh, all the minor final. Brian Hurley got the experience. But since that 2019 game against the likes of Dublin and Tyrone and Roscommon, the whole side has nearly changed. Like, there's, I'm looking at the teams you know, it's nearly a new full back line. Like, John Cooper, Rory Maguire has never played Crow Park. Boris Shanley, I was surprised. I was interviewing him a few weeks ago for college or something, and he hasn't played at Crow Park either. So, this will bring them on so much if these if these players just beat Limerick next Saturday. Like to play in Crow Park to get the experience, that would bring you on as a player. And that could give you confidence to move forward into the division two next year. Undoubtedly, Dublin and Derry will probably be way ahead of the pack. Look at the games of the team sheets um in the in um the next few months. But this will bring us on so much. For um, these young players to be in Crow Park, like the likes of Meath, I don't think have none of them players. Well, they played against Dublin a few weeks ago, but it wasn't a great atmosphere, to be honest with you. Like, look at the team sheet, the car team sheet the other day. Like, I'd say maybe twelve of that starting fifteen haven't been played in Crow Park. So you know, it's going to be an unbelievable 
experience for these players, win or lose. It's bonus to, it's bonus territory. Like we were we were actually saying after the low game coming out of it, it's bonus territory to get to Crow Park. But seeing as we got Limerick this morning now, we have to beat Limerick. We're playing in the park in Kiev as well. So it's mm-hmm. all on a silver platter for us now. We have to beat Limerick. If we don't beat Limerick, there's going to be question marks to come out of the media. But if we beat them, oh, I think the pressure's off in the in them in the next game. Like we can't play Kerry, according to some people on Twitter, but we can play Dublin, Derry, or Galway. There's still going to be tough games there. But to play in Crow Park would be an unbelievable experience for these players, these young players who haven't played in Crow Park before, and it will bring on these players like. I was even mentioning that half back line. That was the half back line since the down game. So they've been playing four games in a row now. So confidence is a big thing. We're having team immunity now. And Daniel Mann is out. Brian Hart. There's a load of players. Killing O'Hanlon. There's a load of players out in this team. And for these players to step up to beat Lode and potentially beat Limerick next week. I think it will do wonders for this team, to be honest with you. Keith Rickett leaving as well. Mustn't have helped the camp whatsoever. But John Cleary seems to have been getting a tune out of these players. Even the performance against Kerry was encouraging. So, you know, it's positive signs if we can beat Limerick. No, that's the big challenge. Beat Limerick and then it's bonus ter- territory for this car team. Yeah, but I suppose on the flip side of that, if you had asked Limerick fans this morning what draw they would have wanted, maybe they might have wanted to clear ahead of Cork because they already beat them. But we've seen how close that was. You know, so I'm sure there's Limerick fans who are watching this thinking we're quite happy with a game against Cork as well. And what a story that would be if they won in Parky Cueve and then sent themselves through to, to an all quarter quarterfinal would be uh, would be quite the story there. Jimmy Mack saying here is Michael Murphy overrated and our Tony Gall a, a soft touch. So certainly has it in for uh, for Tony Gall there. I certainly wouldn't say Michael Murphy is uh, is overrated anyway. I think he's he's unquestionably one of the best footballers um you know of the last 10 years probably the best footballer ever to play for Donegal and in, in, in my opinion but um I suppose moving on to we were speaking to Clare there they beat Mead 111 to, to 19 big big win for Clare I mean I feel like they've had a lot of sort of you know they've they've done a lot of great things in the last sort of 5 to 6 years in terms of the league in terms of being consistent in the league you know producing some top quality footballers and the likes of David Tuberty on Cleary Keelan Sexton's look very good, but they haven't really had a, a big moment as of yet. But this is a big, big win. Like I know Mead have been, you know, pretty terrible all year, to be perfectly honest. But at the same time, for Clare to turn up, deliver, put themselves a win away from an All Ireland quarter final themselves as well, absolutely crucial for uh, for the Banner County. It was a brilliant win for Clare, and even I was chatting to Seamus Brady on a preview my own podcast before. Us. This was probably a win Clare needed. They had these sort of wins in the league. Like, I think they beat, I think, Kildare, or last year, in fact, in the league campaign. They beat Cork a few times as well. But they needed that win, that breakthrough in championship football. They haven't had that in a few years. And to get this win over me, as you rightly said there, most of the Mead players have been awful this year. Like, if there's one positive for me, Harry Hogan's been excellent, I have to say. Like against Cork, he was brilliant in that Division 2 game. And he made five or six saves that night against Clare. I thought he was outstanding. Like he's definitely a player for the future. Andy McAtee's now walked away, and I th- I'm not mm. surprised whatsoever. I thought he'd walk away even before this game, to be honest with you. Like he, he was his sixth year. But there's a question: have Mead actually progressed since Andy McAtee's come in, replacing Bicko Dowd? I'm not sure they actually have. To be honest, there was a great period when they reached the Leinster final. They had a bit of positivity, but no, look at me, football. Jeez, it is absolutely in the mud, to be honest. But you only one good player this year in Harry Hogan. The rest of them, just not enough fight, not enough guile in their team. Like even Jordan Morris being dropped before the throw, and I thought it was strange. I, I really didn't get that decision, decision whatsoever. So I'm talking to a Clare fan and he was saying that Bede set up ultra-defensively against a team on their level. I mean, that doesn't bode well for me, football. I was disappointed in Loud in the other game against Cork, but you could kind of get that they were in Division 3. But Bede have been in Division 2 and Division 1 for how long now? And they're playing defensive football against Clare. I mean, it ended terribly for Bede and it wasn't a good season to begin with either. But uh, for Clare, brilliant achievement in winning this game. Man of from the cornerback was excellent. I have to say, very good driving out the field. Kieran Russell, very good centre-back. 
Owen Cleary, what a class act he is. 10 points in the championship, six for play so far. One outstanding player. Emmett McMahon bringing his cigarettes and form into championship as well. Jamie Malone is really finding his home at wing back. So Clare do have a, and it's bonus territory for them now against Ross Common and the Ring Crow Park. Yes, it's going to be a bit of a stretch for their fans, for their players, getting accommodation and all that. But to get the experience in Crow Park, I think would be vital for these Clare players. I don't think Clare have ever played in Crow Park. I think only Kerry, correct me if I'm wrong, no, in that quarter final a few seasons ago when they played in Crow Park. But other than that, they have never played in Crow Park. So it's a brilliant achievement for Colin Collins, brilliant achievement for Clare. But for me, it started awful with no points in the first half against Galway and it ended awful playing defensive football in this game. And yeah, I don't think they could complain that they're out of the championship early. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a result like this was was really on the cards. Like, even when I seen the scoreline for this, it wasn't even that big of a surprise, to be perfectly honest. And that probably shows, you know, how far Mead have really fallen. Like, it was only in 2020, I remember when they got to the Leinster final, a lot of Mead fans genuinely believed they would beat Dublin in, in, mm. in that Leinster final. And a lot of them believed that they were, you know, on the up and they had a lot of exciting, talented young players, which they still do. Look, they still have a lot of them players still mm. in the panel, but it, it clearly hasn't, you know... There was definitely a stage, I think, under Randy McEntee where Mead were progressing. I think 2020, you could see progression. Like, they went up to Division 1. and um, They were very consistent in all their games. They didn't win any game, but they were very competitive in a lot of those games. Got to a, a Leinster final. I think they were in the Super 8s a year previous as well. Yeah. So, there had been progression. But I think since then, there clearly has been a big, big drop-off. You know, nearly going mm-hmm. down to Division 3. Um, and obviously, being out of the championship, um, quite early on as well in, in this defeat to Clare like you wouldn't have seen back in 2020 if you said Mead would lose to to Clare in a championship game you would have you know you wouldn't have believed that really so I mean Andy McEntee going I'd be curious to know what, what Mead fans think in terms of uh, in terms of who comes in but there'll definitely be a lot of soul searching in the in the Royal County for uh, for, for this winter Ah, there will be. Uh, there just there is a real question of who's going to come in I'd be actually interested to hear your opinion on this Aaron have we gone backwards since Mick O'Dowd, like Andy McAtee has taken over? Or do you think they've actually progressed? Like There was a bit of progression in the middle of his reign, around year three or year four. But now, when you look at me compared to like 2016, 2015, that period of time they lost to Westmead in the semi-final, but they lost to the semi-final again. They got hammered by Dublin and Crow Park, and they went out embarrassingly in the qualifiers this year. So... It, there is an argument they've actually gone backwards under Andy McAtee these six years and maybe it was a bit of a waste of time there. Yeah, I mean, you, you make a, you make some good points, all right. I mean, there was obviously a big transition for, for Mead football. You had a lot of lads obviously retiring sort of from that sort of 2010 sort of crop, like the likes of your Joe Sheridan's, a few other Graham Garrity's, all the rest. Very, very, very hard lads to replace. So there was obviously mm-hmm. going to be a transition point and you know there was a, a couple of years there where it looked quite bleak I mean they obviously lost to Longford I remember in, in that game in the Leinster Championship which was a, a huge huge defeat like and I think they did turn the corner in the last couple of seasons you started to see it and there has been a bit more sort of work in 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 an underage level like you look at the, the the success of the minors as well so I think they are a county that if they can get their act together you know, they, they should be getting to all our quarterfinals, in, mm. in my opinion, anyway. You know, I think I think that they definitely yeah. should be top 10 team uh, in, in the country. But obviously, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll obviously have to, to wait and see there. Horrock says here, Tyrone, not the, the worst defensive in All-Ireland. Mead, champions of 1999, lost their first game in 2000 that's a that's a fair point i suppose maybe they could uh they could be in the in the in the conversation uh vin says here ross common will hammer claire um i mean i think it'll be a lot closer what do you reckon i think it could be actually close but i just think ross common's panel is absolutely outstanding that was the team i really wanted to avoid this morning as a cork fan but claire got the i actually think claire will actually put up a good fight. Let's not forget the league game was a nine points apiece draw in Dr. Hyde Park. So I think this will be closer than people think. But I think Ross Common, because of the players that you have to bring off the bench, we've mentioned this on podcasts before ourselves, they have players all over the field now, just not one individual. And I, I think Connor Cox will hit form. I think Keane McEwen's an excellent player. Cahill Heenan. I just think they had a bad day against Galway. And then again, they only lost by three points. So it wasn't particularly bad for Roscommon in that kind of final. So um, 
I, I think Ross Hammond will eventually win the game, but I think Clare will definitely put up a challenge to them. I think they're an underrated outfit. And to be honest, Clare have been an underrated outfit for years now. Like, they haven't been noticed as maybe a top A team in the country ever. Like, despite being constantly in Division 2, like, that's a credit to Colin Collins and his backroom team there. But I just think Ross Common, not Clare's fault. I think Ross Common genuinely are kind of semi final contenders. That's the stage they're at now. So I think Ross Common will win it, but I think it'll be closer to people. I think it will not be a hammering. I can guarantee you that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be interesting, all right. Obviously, with, with, with Clare playing in Crow Park, mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's certainly going to be a, a big, big moment for them. So it'll be interesting to see, I suppose, how they they handle that occasion. We obviously still have to run through some of the hurling games as well. So we'll just fly through some of the Tolchi and Cup games. I suppose the big one, really, Leitrim 216, Sligo 119, goes to the penalties. Sligo in the end come true. Bit of controversy in this one, actually, as well, because Leitrim had a, had a goal clearly, you know, a goal ruled out for a square ball. Wasn't a square ball at all. Like, I've seen the, the images and obviously seen on the Sunday game as well. It clearly wasn't a square ball, so a, a poor decision there from, from the referee and the umpires. But, look, you back Sligo to come through the, the Tolchin Cup and, and win the competition, and uh, the Sligo men are still alive, just about. They are, yeah. I, I was nervous about my prediction even last week against London, but... um. Yeah, they got over the line and that looked like a clear goal for Leeds from I'm disappointed in that decision, to be all honest. In all honesty, but Keith Bourne, what a performance from him. 1-8. Like, this is what the Tottenham Cup is all about and this game epitomised it in all honesty. Like, two teams evenly matched, going at each other later and um, full later and they were absolutely outstanding. Sligo coming back into the game constantly and Keith Bourne, the, the amount of kicking from this guy, like... If Lee from State, the All-Ireland qualifiers, I don't think he would have got this much recognition from the J, you know, podcast or anything like that. And on honesty, he's an excellent, excellent footballer. And it's brilliant. It's brilliant that um, it was evenly matched in the end. Um, obviously, delighted to keep my own integrity to Sligors in the semi-points. They've covered next, so that would be a difficult game for them to get through. Uh, but, yeah, brilliant win. Uh, brilliant win for Sligo on penalties with Leitrim there's something to build on for Andy Moore next year let's not forget it's his first year in charge so um, fair play to Leitrim there fair play to all the team and this is what the Tattoo Cup is all about evenly matched teams going hell for later and what a game we got and uh, for those who tuned in on GA Go well done you got your money's worth yeah, Jimmy Max says here, Tolchin Cup, a success. Yeah, Lads, I suppose definitely so far, you'd have to say mm-hmm. so. Like, There's been a lot of very, very good and entertaining games. I think the only one-sided sort of hammering I can remember really is obviously Offaly, who, 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 beat, who beat New York very comfortably. But I think there's a lot of moving factors really to that. I mean, the fact that New York are obviously, you know, they, they don't get to play that many competitive games that often Offaly were coming in on the back of two big wins against Wicklow and Wexford. And I've obviously, you know, been relegated from Division 2 this year, so quite a high mark from them. But I suppose, speaking of Offaly, I mean, as we were saying, they're a very comfortable win against New York. So, I mean, look, they're, they're trickling along very nicely. That's three wins now on the bounce. Um, they've avoided Cavan in the in the semi-finals. They've got Westmead in the in the Tolchin Cup semi-finals. I mean, getting to a final isn't inconceivable, and, and Offaly mm. will probably fancy their chances against Westmead. They'd have to, yeah. Five different scores uh, out of their four, six forwards. That was a brilliant achievement by them. But looking at the highlights, real at New York were probably a bit naive defensively. Um, maybe a bit of jet lag there, in all honesty. But um, look, um, it was brilliant to see New York, first of all, being in Ireland. It was a brilliant achievement to even play a game in Ireland for the first time since, I think, 2000 or 2001. If someone comments might correct me there, but... Fair play to them for even travelling to the game. And um, yeah, brilliant occasion overall. But for Offaly, as you say, they're tipping along nicely. After a bit of a disappointing few games against Cork and um, then against Wexford, obviously, the Leinster Championship. But they're getting momentum now. They're playing Westmead in Crow Park. I think these Offaly players will relish us. And let's not forget, off some of these under-20s, these will come in handy. They played in Crow Park last year and that's finally against Ross Common. So, um. Yeah, I think Offaly will definitely register the challenge, but for New York, they'll have to go again next year. They'll get the experience from this, and hopefully, for their sake, we'll go further into the Tantian Cup. But fair play to Offaly for racking up a very good score in this game. Yeah, and it was Carlo 213, Westmead 121. And look, I mean, you have to, although you know it was a five point defeat from, from Carlo, like you have mm-hmm. to commend them really for, for how they've approached the, the Tantian Cup. 
for the performances that they've given. They've definitely given a, a lot of optimism for their fans going into 2023, in my opinion, because, you know, there was some awful results really in the league. I think they were beating like 27 points or something like that by Sligo in Division mm-hmm. 4. When you think they're coming up against Westmead, who played Division 2 football last year, very close to getting promoted in Division 3. And they ran them very, very close, like from following on score BO, like this was very close game and there was probably moments mm-hmm. in this where Carlo might have felt like they could have won this. Absolutely. And even beating Tiveri last week was a big achievement for them. Colin Parkinson actually argues a Sligo for the story this Tati Cup. I'd argue Carlo were, to be honest with you. Like, no one expected Carlo to win a game in this competition because of how they finished the league campaign and how they were so over their depth in that Linz Championship game against Lowe's. But they beat Tipperary. They came very, very close to a shock here against Westmead, not to be in the end. But there's something to build on for Noel Cruz players next year. Another positive with the Tati Cup, to be honest. You get these teams out of nowhere, to be honest with you, bottom of the league, and almost getting to Crow Park. What a story that would have been for Carlo. But for Westmead, I think they've taken the competition seriously. Fair play to Jack Cooney and his players. Again, John Hazlin, one outstanding player, one nine for him. Maybe Lee Roberts' red card was the changing of this game, but but for related Westmead for getting over the challenge, they're now in Crow Park for a second time this year. And they played well in the first time against Kildare. And uh, hopefully for their sake, they performed well again against Offaly. But for Carlo, I honestly think they're the story of this competition. Fair play to them, fair play to Noel Crew and his and his crew for doing such a very good job at the Tatian Cup this season. Absolutely, and it was from Anna 13 points, Cavan 2-16. Supposed to be on paper anyway, the toughest game of the, the Tauchin Cup so far for Cavan. I mean, going away to Brewster Park at a ground that they lost on last year. But again, they passed the test with flying colours, very comfortable. A nine-point victory away to, uh, to their rivals. Thomas Gallagher scoring 1-4. Mm-hmm. Gro McKernan with five points as well. Faulkner with a goal. So... Cavan, I mean, look, they're they're the favourites for a reason, and at the minute they're they're living up to the to the hype and the the favourites tag that they have on them going into this Talchin Cup. They definitely are, and the credit to Cavan as well for taking this seriously. Maybe there could have been arguments that a few of their players, after winning an Ulster Championship that high in twenty twenty, might have gone abroad or something like that, or maybe just quit the panel like the Tyrone fellas have done. But these players, Thomas Gallagher, Garrod McKeon, and Paddy Lynch, they're taking this competition seriously, and. Fair play to Vicky Graham and his players for that. For Fermanagh, I suppose it was a young team. Kira Donnelly was building and he'll build on it again next year. But undoubtedly, Cavill will be favourites. Uh, for my own prediction, I hope Sligo will win the game. And in Crow Park, I don't honestly think they will. I think Cavill might, might be a bridge too far for Sligo. But uh, fair play for Cavill for taking it seriously. But for Mana, they'll go again next year. I think they have some very good young players coming through. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, look, it was a it was a big, big win for for Cavan. And as you said, they're going up against Sligo. You would get the feeling mm-hmm. that it might be just a step too far for for Sligo in Crow Park as well, where Cavan, you know, have been playing there quite a lot recently. You know, obviously in the Division Four final as well. So they're getting their fans plenty of uh, plenty of days out in in Crow Park. So you probably would have to you would have to back them. We'll move on to uh, some of the, the hurling games from the weekend. And, I mean, the I suppose really the biggest game of the weekend, probably in the in the entirety of the GA, was Limerick and Clare. It was Limerick 129, Clare 29 points. I mean, a, a spectacle, really, of, of hurling from both sides. You had big challenges, big goals mm-hmm. as well, um, big decisions from the referee, which, as we were saying off air, he'd done you know, very, very well in this game, to be fair mm-hmm. to him. Um, and look, Limerick again, when the Cohen's got tough, they found an answer and they found a way to respond. Absolutely. And you should ex- appreciate greatness when it's just there. Like Limerick were absolutely outstanding. Seamus Flanagan, eight points out of nowhere. Argoland didn't have his best game, but still pulled a few points for play out of the bag. Like even Connor Boylan coming on, Declan Hannon getting that late score until afterwards, Tony Kelly hit a sideline. But this game absolutely had everything. And um Clare were probably the better team for most of the game, but it just shows great champions when there is there, and Limerick just epitomised that. Like, when they were under the cosh, they still found a way somehow to win this game, and fair play to them for that. What an achievement for their players, what an achievement for John Coyley, four monsters in a row, which we all know it's a very hard thing to do. Fair play to them, but um, as we were seeing greatly off the air, the referee was absolutely outstanding, and John Keenan from Wicklow had a brilliant game, to be honest with you. I've had a few clear fans get on to me saying it's a terrible game and all that, but 
I think, I think even though, so like even look at the stats of the game, 18 frees each, 14 scoreable frees each. So, you know, I, I think he evened the game out very well. Maybe there was a few incidents like Rory Hayes probably should have got a red card. Seamus Flanagan, a few incidents there. Like him. There was a few incidents in the game where there was dirty challenges and the incident of the tunnel. I, and while we're on that, I was so disappointed someone from with an RT camera didn't race in for that. Maybe they could have got a punch along the way or something like that, but... I was thinking, get in for by hook or by crook, get into that because we wanted to see yeah. that entertainment at the end of the game. But um, it, well, we had enough entertainment at the pitch. But um, fair play to both sides in the in the pouring rain as well. Fair play to both sides for putting on a spectacle. Fair play to the referee and what a game this was. And clear we're going to the All Ireland series now. Probably playing Wexford in the quarter final. Optimism now. They, I think they only have to get over Wex for the Kilkenny to get to the order of the final. That's a realistic objective. So, fair play to clear, but Limerick, they are champions for a reason and they are a team to be re- feared for a reason. They are absolutely superb outfit and never say die. Yeah, I mean, they just always seem to find a way. I mean, I was saying earlier, like with, with Jurgen Klopp sometimes, and he's speaking about Liverpool and he refers to them as mentality monsters. I mean, you could literally say that about this Limerick team because every time the goings got tough, every time they've been pushed to the pin of their collar, they just find a way by hook or by crook. And it's always different ways as well. You know, sometimes it might be moving Cole Hayes further up the pitch. You know, Shamey Flanagan might step up. It'll be Tom Morrissey who will step up. It'll be, you know, Jeremy Burns, Declan Hannan, or, you know, it might be David Reedy coming off the bench. You know, they just have so many options and so many different ways of winning games. And like Shamey Flanagan, excellent with eight points. Barry Nash, unbelievable at, at cornerback as well. You know, and, and defensively, you know, being able to shut out a lot of those clear goal chances, I think was was key really for Limerick and winning this game. Absolutely, it was. I think they only had one goal chance where I think it was in um, from I think it was Sean Finn got in the way, his leg got in the way to slitter. What a superb block from him. I think they really had one goal chance in the entire game. Uh, and while we're on goals, Garrod Hague with his goal was needed number one and number two. What a finish from him. Mm. And again, I think like he was player of the year in 2020, but it's probably gone in under the radar since then. He had a very good performance in the other final last year against Cork and another good performance again yesterday. He was absolutely outstanding. And then, um, yeah, Limerick, when the going got tough, you talk about mentality monsters there, like, you just wonder how they keep doing it. It's kind of like, um, you know, Dublin, when they were under the cash against Mayo in football, it kind of reminds me about that. Mm. When this Limber team is under the cash, even the Tipperary game last year, you're thinking, how did they recover from that? And this game, look, clear, we're so far ahead in most aspects of the game, but still Limber found a way to get through it. Even the last minute drama as well, Declan Hannon pucking the ball over the bar and, you think Clare aren't going to get it? Limerick I finally won this Munster title after a brilliant battle. The ball goes up for a sideline. I was thinking um, Peter Duggan might get it over. But then when Tony Kelly walks over, I'm thinking, mm, will, he, will he get it over from this tight angle? But what a score. He didn't even have to take twice, which is the most impressive thing. Just put it over the bar like the, like the brilliant player he is. Probably up there with one of the greatest of all time. 13 points again yesterday. What a superb display from him. And yeah, what a superb display from Clare in general as well. David Fitzgerald from midfield, five points. Ryan Taylor was brilliant from corner forward. So brilliant from Clare. But um, Limerick lived the fight another day in the Munster Championship. Like four wins in a row. Like who would have thought that about this Limerick team? Like I don't think four in a row is not to be done. I think since. I don't know, Cork yeah. in the seventies or something. Like that. like, yeah, I think, I think the only, I think the only, I think yeah, I think Cork did it in the eighties. There might have been a few other teams mm-hmm. as well, but no, no teams ever done five in a row in uh, in Munster. So I mean, that's mm-hmm. going to be the the big one next year to see if they could go and and do five in a row. And as you said there, like I mean, like is there any stopping them? Like it just like I know we're we're always going to have the conversation, and you know because the the questions do need to be asked and you do need to discuss these games and all the rest. Otherwise, there be no there be no point. But I mean. It does. It, you just look at it and you just think there's no way the All Ireland doesn't end up in Limerick this year because no matter what test they face, like they 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 just seem to always find a way to come through mm-hmm. it. And you know whoever they're playing in the semi finals or final, you know of the All Ireland, they're probably going to find a way there as well because they they seem to always do so. 
had to do. Yeah, they were absolutely super road for, for um, a reason there. And a lot of people were saying during the league, this team is finished. And I stuck to my guns. I was saying, this team is only getting ready. It's only getting warmed up. And then in the Munster Championship, they exploded against Cork. They exploded against Watford for periods of that game. And again, it, when it matters, they exploded again. And that's a sign of a great team. And they, I said in your podcast, I think a few months ago, that they could even win five All-Irelands, never mind Munsters in a row. You were saying maybe not. I'm not sure what you think now. I just think this team is just so good in every area of the pitch. And even Kyle Hayes didn't have his best performance yesterday, but you have David Reedy to come on. You have Con- Conor Boyle to come on. You have Oshin O'Reilly to come on now from Kilmallock. He's been very good for club, and now he's doing very good for Limerick in the last few years or so. So, you know, Pat Ryan's been kicked off the panel, but still you have impact subs coming off the coming um, into us. Colin Collin coming in from the under-20s. Adam English was there. Didn't even come on yesterday. Colin O'Neill has come in seamlessly into this team and has done absolutely outstanding. So they have more players coming. Paul Canark and John Kiley keep are keeping this team ticking. And for as long as they keep going, I don't think there's going to be a team to stop them. In all honesty, I think Clare could have done yesterday if they had maybe a bit more tactical notes about them. Mm. But even like if they get to the if these two sides get to the order of the final, I wouldn't be surprised if Limerick pull off a performance like they did against Cork last year. It, it, they're that good. They could switch it on just in an instant. They're an absolutely outstanding team. And I honestly think I'll stick to my guns. They could win five or six in a row of all Ireland's. They're that good. Yeah, I mean, as you said there, like I mean, you, you see how quick things can change in 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 hurling a lot of the time. Like you see that with Waterford this year, for example, second best team in the country, all of a sudden knocked out. But look, the precedent is there. Like I mean, year in year out now since twenty nineteen, they keep finding an answer. They keep finding a way. You know, it'd be interesting to see what happens if they were to maybe lose a Munster final and how they'd respond to that. Obviously, I mean, we know now like the, if they if they were to lose in a semi final or final, obviously there's no way back from there, but. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what would happen there. But as you said, it does look like, I mean, what if they win the All-Ireland this year? It'd be, what, three in a row? It, it is It is very similar as well to to the dubs. I mean, you can even look at Limerick's defeat to Kilkenny being the, the turning point that Dublin had when they lost to Donegal under Jim Gavin. Like, there's a lot of sort of similarities there between the between the, the two counties. Um, but as for Clare, I mean, look, as you said there, you know, very, very positive from them, um, obviously the, the likes of Tony Kelly, Peter Duggan going off in, in extra time, which was definitely a huge hindrance. But look, I mean, they're definitely a team to be feared. I mean, the energy that they played with, Tony Kelly, excellent again. Peter Duggan, very good. And and Davey Fitzgerald, I mean, living up to the name in midfield, you know, coming out of retirement after managing Wexford and you know, Waterford, you know. I mean, hitting five points in the middle, not too bad. Yeah, for such a small man as well. Yeah, super, super from uh, David Fitzgerald midfield as well. Who thought that would happen? But um, all jokes aside, yeah, like what a super performance from Clare. And um, a lot of people going into the game thought they'd get hammered by this Limerick team, but what a performance from them. And well, um, a lot of people said they finished part of this monster group. Well, they're now on the cusp of doing something brilliant. Like, but the disappointing aspect from Clare, I thought, was their fans on social media. I thought the players were absolutely outstanding. But some of the fans on social media were saying, oh, the referee was a disgrace. But the referee was clearly unbiased. He was clearly letting the game flow, I thought. I, in most people's opinions as well, that he was absolutely outstanding. But Clare fans seem to think that everything went against them. Maybe that's just the last talking, but they keep talking and talking and talking. But I'm just saying... Focus on Wex- Wexford, though, because you only have to beat Wexford and Kilkenny and you're in an all Ireland vinyl. You're that close to an all Ireland vinyl, though. You need to concentrate on that. Perform like you did against Limerick uh, yesterday. And the sky's the limit for you. I thought they were absolutely outstanding. Peter Duggan has really helped coming back into the team. There might have been a few controversial incidents with him yesterday, but you need that aggression at the same time in this um, in this game. Rory Hayes again outstanding. David Fitzgerald, as I mentioned, Ryan Taylor, Tony Kelly, Cotton Malone doesn't seem to be scoring much as he did in pre- the previous two years, but he's working way harder for the team than he ever did. He's been absolutely brilliant. Dermot Ryan, Shane Me, and he's only 19 coming off the bench and scoring a point. What a superb um, cameo from him as well. And Claire do have the panel and 
a lot of people were saying after last year that Brian Lohan was probably right to say that he could leave. But I was saying Clare fans need to be patient with him. There's something building in this team and voila, something is building with this team. They're on the cusp of, of an honour of final low. Their first since 2013, their first semi-final appearance since 2019. But yeah, they have to keep their feet in the ground now. They have to put this game to one side now and concentrate on Wexford or Kerry, of course. I'm not going to disrespect the men from the kingdom there. But um, yeah, f- fair play to Clare. Brilliant performance. But concentrate in the quarterfinal now and they're all ready for road. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's the big one, isn't it? Like, I mean, they've... They've, they've sort of been the underdogs through the, the Munster Championship. They're, they're underdogs against Limerick as well. Now, all of a sudden, there's a bit of, bit of different pressure now on this Clare side because we've seen that they can deliver. They beat Wexford in the last two championship games when Wexford were probably going in as the favourites in both of those two games. So, um, And obviously then, if they were to get past Wexford, as as, uh, as Jack says here, easy to say Clare will be favourites, but don't write off Kilkenny in a one-off game. And that is the point because... You know, Kilkenny in an All Ireland semi final, like you, you can't sleep on that on them either. I know Kilkenny have lost the last two All Ireland semi finals they've been in, but yeah, I mean, look for 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 Clare for the Clare fans. Although a lot of them weren't happy on on social media, like you said, and I'm not too sure what that was about. Um, they do have a lot to be positive for now going into the, I suppose the rest of the season. Absolutely, and um, if the players keep performing the way they do, the sky's the limit, as I said, for them. And this will be a building block for Clare. In the next few seasons, like the last few years have been hit and miss really for them. Like Seamus Brady actually mentioned a good point in my podcast. I think maybe it was a, another episode or maybe it was this week's preview or something like that. Clear had a lot of wides last year. We were sitting here talking about if they rectify that, maybe they could get further in the competition. And they've definitely rectified that. Maybe not so much yesterday. I I would grant them grant them that to be honest with you, because the conditions were absolutely dreadful for both sides, not just Clare. The Wise yesterday, like there was 17 or 16 Wyes for either side or something yesterday. So, I'll look, I'll grant them that it was um, a poor day for hurling. But other than that game, Clare have been razor sharp in front of goal and they've rectified that. And we were asking the question if they rectify that, where can they get? This this year proves that they could get to a quarter final, a semi final, possibly a final. And that is credit to Brian Lohan for that, for fixing that issue when the pundits were saying that was the clear issue with this clear team. And he's rectified that. And clear or no, a few, only two games away now from an all Ireland line. Who taught that in the league campaign of this year? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it is a great point that you make there. And I do think as well, like when you when you look at Clare and obviously the the obviously uh, the the performance as well against Limerick, it was uh, was absolutely. Huge and crucial in in many ways. I was going to say something there, and I lost my my complete train of thought. So we'll we'll get back to that at some point. But Jimmy Max says here, any chance of an English perspective on the show, Aaron? I'm a massive GA fan. Yeah, I'd be curious to know what exactly you mean. I mean, I would definitely love to hopefully get some um, you know London footballers, managers, all the rest on the on the podcast at some point. I mean, that would be that'd be great to great to see. But um, look, moving on, I suppose to the Galway Kilkenny. Uh, Kilkenny, as we were talking about there, finding a way to, to deliver and, and get the victory in the end by a scoreline of 22 points to 17. But, I mean, in your opinion, I mean, it wasn't a great game, to be perfectly honest, in terms of a hurling. The atmosphere looked fairly dead. The handshake mm-hmm. really seems to be the only thing people are, are mostly interested in. You nearly forget there even was a game going on if you looked on mm-hmm. Twitter and social media. But look for Kilkenny once again when the chips are down. They find a way and answer and 17 lengths at titles now for Brian Cody. I mean, that is incredible, really. Yeah, I think they're level low. So I think Wexford in the role of honour, though, Cody and Wexford. And I think they're only two or three behind Dublin. I'm not entirely sure, no, but they're only a small bit behind Dublin as well. Brian Cody, what a man, what a manager he is. But you were right there. It was a pretty awful game. Like, when you look at the stats, like 18 points between the two sides from play. Like, like in a hurling game. And when you look, that was the total clear from play managed in the Munster final. Like, I mean, you know, the Munster final was clear, the Leinster final this year was clear. It was it was definite there. But um, the main thing was, it was off the pitch, the handshake. Um, we we knew it'd be tense. It would be tense and um, they'll get the handshake. For a moment there, I thought that um, 
Henry was just standing there, um, arms crossed. Brian Cody was just uh, lauding it in. He's 17th Leinster title, as you said. He was congratulating players and all that. But eventually he went over to him. And I don't know what he said. Like, I was mentioning this in a post on Instagram. I don't know what he said. I'd love a lip reader to come on to the podcast or something like that. Just, just give us an insight. What did Cody say to him that made Henry a bit unhappy? Like, he was shaking his head, come, um, just walking away. Like, oh, there had to be some tension there. But in a way, it's quite sad. I, I think the the two of them uh, the two two of them spent so much time together, so many brilliant moments like all learning titles and all that. Like James Brady again was mentioning that this is kind of like Roy Keane and Alex Ferguson at Man United. They spent so many times as player, manager, captain, and manager. And then as when there were two managers, when Roy was manager of Sunderland, their teams things seemed to be frosty on the sideline then. So I, I don't know what it is that, like. Look, I don't know was it all for show, to be honest with you. Maybe Cody, yeah. I, I, I really, really don't know. But even I was looking at the photo, I think I, I've seen it on Twitter somewhere. Paulie O'Shea and uh, Mick O'Dwyer, they had their bust-ups in the past in like the 80s. But then when Westmead faced Leash in 2004, there was happiness between the two, even Mick O'Dwyer losing. There was no begrudging or anything. They shook hands like men. And... I, I, I would have liked to see, I know there's drama between Brian Cody and Henry Sheffield. We love to see drama, obviously, and, um, you know, taking things into the media, something to talk about. Well, thank God, in this case, there was something to talk about because the game itself was pretty poor. But at the same time, it is pretty sad. Like, the two of them spent um, brilliant years together in a great team, possibly one of the greatest of all time that Kilkenny team, Henry being the greatest player of all time and Cody being possibly one of the greatest manager of all time. That's down to interpretation. But for them, with frosty relations on the sideline, I think it's great for media, but at the same time, it is sad to see. I don't don't know what you think about that yourself. Is it sad to see? Or is it probably a bit of both, to be honest with you? Yeah, it's a hard one to know, really, because like when you you look at the, the handshake, I mean... Apart, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, the, the whole reason why there's a, there's a bit of, you know, bite between the two is obviously because he's gone to manage Galway and they're big rivals. But I don't know. I feel like there's there's something, there's, so, there's a subplot in this story here that we're missing somewhere. Um, and we all know that Brian Cody haven't achieved what he achieved as a player, of course, with Kilkenny, but obviously as a manager with Valley Hill Shamrocks winning multiple All-Irelands. I think he was... It was set in stone for him to, to to be the next Kilkenny manager. Like he was the the heir of the throne. He was going to be the replacement. He was going to be the man to eventually replace Brian Cody. And I think a lot of people fell for a long time. Oh, this is going to be Cody's last year. He's going to go. He's going to leave here. And he and he just didn't. He just he just kept staying. And maybe was there something going on with 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 Shefflin kind of waiting for that job? You know, maybe did did Brian Cody feel like Shefflin's kind of secretly gunning for his job and. Whilst we're all saying that Shefflin has given so much to Brian Cody down the years, maybe Brian Cody looks at it the other way and thinks, well, look, I'm the one who put him in the team. I'm the one who managed the team, put the players together, d- designed the systems, you know, helped him win as many all Orleans as he did. And yeah, he's trying to, you know, get my job. Do you know what I mean? Like I was just kind of reading between the lines. Now it could all be, could all be completely hearsay and it's probably all a lot of BS, but you know, like when I just do feel like there's more to it than than just this. You know, just a ha- just the fact that he manages Galway. You know, but it is an interesting one because even at the end of the game, Henry was in the tunnel just waiting for every Kilkenny player and saying, "Well done in your Leinster title." Like, mm. I don't think there's frosty relations between the players. I think Henry respects the players. Obviously, Owen Cody, who we managed, and Valley Hill Shamrocks, and many other players. TJ Redo was in some ways. His apprentice um, in, in the years when he did play for Kilkenny. I, I don't know what it is. Like I, I was seeing, I was reading a few DMs from a few people on Instagram and Twitter, seeing a few perspectives on this, and they were saying maybe Cody is just old school. Maybe he said something that maybe um, Henry didn't like that much, or like I was hearing Cody didn't go to engagement parties. It wasn't his thing at all. He's just right, not yeah. into the modern world or something like that. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe he's just set in his ways. He's just going to stick to these and he's just going to do it his way. But um, I don't know, does Henry like that? But 
I know it was entertainment for the fans, to be on in all honesty, but just Henry, I thought they turned the corner when they were shaking hands, and Henry, uh, Cody looked like he said off, off they go, but when Henry was just shaking his head, I was like, oh, geez, geez something's nasty has happened here, and obviously we'd love to hear what Cody exactly said, but yeah. I, 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 I just find it very, very, very sad. I know it's, it's great content for yourself and myself and for off the ball and loads of people around Instagram and Twitter for the G in the GA world. But it's just sad. I, I think it's it's very sad. Like you you think it'd be very easy just to make up make up differences and all of that and put differences just to one side of an argument or something like that. But I don't know what's going on. Is it Cody sticky to his old ways? I I don't know. I, I'm just interested in what he said to be to be honest. He did make Henry that angry at, in the aftermath. Yeah, like I've watched it a few times myself, and I'm no lip reader by any by any stretch of the imagination. It sounded like he said best of luck to you. Um, that that's kind of, that was kind of what I, I I I thought I got, but then again, I don't know. You know, it's very it's very it's very hard to know. Like you could you could lip read that in multiple different ways. I like can. He could have easily said uh, something completely different. I mean, at the same time, like there, there mightn't be that much in it as well. Like it, I feel like I felt like with the first handshake, the media were making too much of a of a meal out of it. To be perfectly honest, I feel like with this one, there definitely is more substance to it because, like, they waited to to shake each other's hand, and then you obviously have Shefflin walking away, shaking his head, like you said, he looked very riled up and angry all of a sudden, you know what I mean? And he wasn't like that when the first, when the whistle originally blew. So just a little strange, to be honest, what's, um, what's going on between the, the two of them. And it would be interesting certainly to, to see what he said, but like what you said, like the fact that we're speaking more about this than the actual game between Galway and Kilkenny, like that probably does go to show, you know, that it just wasn't a, a great game at all. And, and, and Galway, to be fair, probably didn't live up to the expectations that they set. Um, throughout the the round robin in Leinster, ah, uh, they didn't know, uh, didn't whatsoever. Eight points for play, in seventy minutes for them. Like, oh my god, Connor Cooney was missing. I think three or four frees as well. Like that's very poor. You can't do that in a Leinster final. And TJ Fairliston was very good, immaculate in many ways, on the free taking duties. But um, and Kilkenny were outstanding. Power Walsh coming off the bench was brilliant. Walter Walsh gave a bit, a bit of age as well. Mikey Butler, man the match, Mikey Carey. They seem to be building a team, but the crucial thing now for Kilkenny is, can they do it in another semi-final? They didn't in the last few years. They flapped with this eve against Watford and then against Cork, where they were very poor. Like, oh, would be saved them so many times against Cork last year? You have to wonder, which, I don't know, will it be against Wexford, against Clare? I don't know who it will be. But whoever it is, Kilkenny need to up it now. They need to open an all semi final. I think most people would have guessed that Kilkenny would have won Leinster despite what Galway did in the league and the Round Robin series. The main challenge would have been the Leinster Championship. For Galway now, I, it's a very tough one now because if Cork, I'm not disregarding Antrim by any stretch of the imagination, I think Cork will have a tough game against Antrim and Cork at Park. But if Cork, as expected, get through that, Cork usually beat Galway in these uh, quarterfinals, semi finals, or whatever. This will be a very tough game for Galway and for Henry Shefflin. The like Cork beat them in Parky Cueve earlier on the year, and Cork are improving now. They have more heart in the team. They seem to have a few things being clicked now under um, under Kieran Kingston. Uh, Alan Connolly seems to be a goal getter, so that will be a tough game now for Galway. And if they don't get past that game, that could be a failure of a season now for Galway. And after a poor performance against Kilkenny, that could do- have a domino effect now going into a game against Antrim or Cork very easily. Yeah, it could be all right. And and given the, the momentum that we've seen from Cork, obviously finishing the, the way they finished the Munster Championship, and it'd be tricky enough test against Antrim. You'd expect them to get through that, but suddenly a potential meeting between Cork and Galway sounds, uh, sounds very, very fascinating indeed. We'll run on to the Joe McDonough Cup final. It was Antrim 5-22, Kerry... 424. I mean, this was probably the game of the weekend, to be honest. I mean, I know Limerick and Clare, you know, was probably was a bigger spectacle and there was more eyes on it. And and maybe because of the occasion, it, it would be a bigger game. But in terms of quality, in terms of entertainment, I mean, yes, you can criticize a lot of the defending that was on show, but nine goals in, in total. I mean, Kerry were 11 points down on the 40th minute when they conceded their 
their fifth goal or their fourth goal of the game. But, you know, a huge, huge comeback right at the death. And that goal right at the end mm. from Podrick Boyle meant nothing. Obviously, it was it, it was over by then. But mm. I suppose at the same time, from a, from, a, from a Kerry perspective, a lot of positives. But it's Antrim who once again get the, uh, the victory against Kerry in the John McDonough Cup final. Yeah, it was very tight, tighter than expected towards the end of the game. What a game it was. Um, yeah, it's interesting what people would think about this. Like, Claire Limerick was a, a bigger spectacle, obviously, but and it was dramatic. But this game, my God, it was end-to-end stuff. You, you thought in the first half Antrim would run away with it. Even I didn't watch the game personally. I was looking at the Scorpio app, and I was thinking, oh, Antrim are running away with this, unfortunately. I'm well up for Kerry Hurling, obviously. But then Kerry... Get a goal through a penalty. I'm thinking, can they get back into this game? Then Antrim score another goal, another few goals. I'm thinking, whoa, uh, Kerry are going to get a hammering here. But Jordan Conway, 2 2 off the bench. What a superb performance from him. Porrick Boyle, obviously the whistle blew in the end, but what a performance from him. And to get through one point of Antrim, like, geez, like Kerry, how close can you get? Three finalists to lose in a row. That must be gut wrenching for uh, Stephen Lovely and his team. Look, um, Kerry they had a very good year in, in general. Uh, like Antrim were expected to win the game, and even look at stats before the game. I think Antrim averaged a scoring goals record of four, and they averaged a concession goals rate I think of two or three. So it, it kind of was going to end up that way, you know. And honestly, I know Kerry didn't score both goals themselves, but when you look at Antrim's goal goal concession record, I think they could see is what was this uh, eleven goals in um. In five games in the Joe McDonough Cup, they scored 20 themselves. That's 25 goals in six games for Antrim. Like, I, I just wonder, if they bring that goal-scoring form into Cork, who aren't the best defensively now in Corrigan Park, that could be a tricky trip, um, trip up now for Cork. But, yeah, fair play to Antrim for getting the, the win over the line. But for Kerry, disappointment for them. They have to move on to Wexford now next week, which uh, I think Wexford should have enough for them in three. But... You never know with this Kerry team. Stephen Lofi seems to have them well oiled, but Antrum, second drum had done a couple of three years, bring the Jeep in for them. And there's a realistic chance now of them staying up next year. They have to challenge West Mead, which isn't as bad as a leash team that was confident last year. So, would oh, the Antrum have a realistic game now to stay up? They have to stay up, I think, in my opinion, next year. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they clearly have bags of quality. We've seen them, obviously, in the league and, and some big performances in the last couple of seasons. And Big, big victory, as you, as you said here. And, um, you know, I think they were everyone's pick to, to win the John McDonough Cup before a ball was pucked. And um, they've obviously gone ahead and delivered. Sean was saying here, anyone know where the game will be played? Galway versus Cork Antrim. Do you have any takes on that? I mean, sometimes they play a lot of quarterfinals in Crow Park, but maybe with this one, they might go tourless, maybe. I'm not sure, sure, to be honest, which way they go, yeah. It's probably going to be Torless because the other quarterfinal is most likely going to be clear. Wexford, I would think that's in the middle. That's in Torless. It might be a double header. It could, it could be a double header in Torless. Like, um, none of the football games are going to be played in Torless. So I think the only games that are going to be played in Torless now in your county wise the rest of the year is uh, LJFA and Camogie. That's it. So, Torless is well available. I think it'll be on a Torless. Um, in all honesty, it, w- it will definitely not be Parky Keith because. That's just unfair on Galway. So I think it'll be Torless already. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, uh, I suppose before we finish up, then obviously your own podcast, GA Statsman, where can people uh, find that if they're uh, if they're looking for it? Yeah. Just search uh, GA Statsman on, um, on uh, Instagram. Well, GA underscore underscore Statsman too. No, my new account. Uh, G- well, GA Statsman, you can just search it on Google anyway. And, um, if, another thing, if you search Google and uh, GA Statsman, then follow by the word Google, you'll actually get, or you can go onto my Instagram bio or Twitter bio and click a link. And I have all my stats on um, on that site there if you want to check it out. As for the podcast, it's on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube now. I'm recording on YouTube. A few technical difficulties last week with Zoom and uh, down by camera last week. So, um, Few technical difficulties there should be fixed now for next week's preview, but um, we'll have to see. But um, yeah, it, you could just search GA Assessment on Google, Instagram, YouTube now. I'm on YouTube, Spotify, so I'm everywhere really. So um, I have a podcast, I have stats in every game nearly. So yeah, um, search me on that and you're all good to go. Yeah, top, top man. Well, look, listen, appreciate you, Matthew, jumping on. And um, yeah, cheers to anyone who tuned into the stream if you could leave a like and subscribe getting very close to 3,000 subscribers so if you could 
subscribe. That'd be absolutely brilliant. And um, yeah, make sure to check out Matthew's uh, podcast and Instagram and all the rest as well. So yeah, cheers, Matthew, for coming on, top man. Thanks very much, Aaron, and uh, up the Rebels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll